Welcome to the Field and Garden Podcast. I'm Jesse from the Gardener's Workshop. Today, I'm sharing a webinar that Lisa and Jenny Love did called Top 5 Mistakes That New Farmer Florists Make. Jenny and Lisa put this one together with the hope of helping new farmer florists avoid some common pitfalls, all mistakes that Jenny admits to making herself when she was first starting out. There are some great tips in here, so I hope you enjoy. We got some great stuff for you guys tonight. For now, what I wanted to come on here tonight to do was to talk about the five mistakes that are so common for new farmer florists um, and just review that a little bit because there's so many people who are going to enter um, the coming season in hopes of becoming a farmer florist. So I thought it'd be a fun time to talk about these five common mistakes so that you all can learn a little bit more and plan ahead for a more successful season coming up. So, so here we go. We're going to dive right in to the five common mistakes that I see a lot of new farmer florists make. So, and I, these are all mistakes that I made myself in the beginning. So I'm speaking from experience here. Uh, so one of the biggest mistakes that I see new farmer florists make is that they don't value how important a walk-in cooler is to the success of their operation. So a lot of farmer florists try to get started and don't have a cooler yet. And I completely understand why, because I didn't have a cooler for my first three seasons either. So I get it, I understand it seems like a big ticket price um, and you don't necessarily have a lot of money to spend at the beginning of your operation. So I'm here to encourage you to prioritize that expense and put it at the top of the list instead of letting it slowly fall down to the bottom of the list because you're just intimidated by the concept of getting a cooler put in at your, um, at your farm or wherever you could possibly put it in if you have a design space or wherever it might be. So the reasons that you nearly need a cooler is because you're working with a very perishable product. Ideally, you want to be charging a good price for that product. And so if you routinely show up at a wedding with somewhat wilted flowers, it's going to be hard to get clients to be really happy with your work. So if you have a cooler, you can start the design process so much earlier in the week. It's going to reduce your stress level as a designer. You're going to have a much higher quality product to offer your client. And then also you can store flowers for longer from your harvest window. So it's not just about being able to um, properly store the, the finished design flowers, but you as a farmer florist need to be able to be harvesting like a week or more in advance for your wedding work so that you have enough flowers and enough stems to actually do the wedding. So, so a cooler is absolutely hands down the best thing you can invest in from the start for your farmer florist operation. Every flower farmer should have a cooler, but you definitely, definitely, definitely need a cooler if you're going to start doing weddings and other large events. So do that this season. I don't care whether you're just starting out or not, do it this season. So that is mistake number one. I have a question. Oh boy, <laughs> always a question. So <laughs> you are on board with CoolBots? I am. I love CoolBots. Yeah, I, I love have them. a CoolBot. I've had a CoolBot since the beginning. My cooler is actually an old cooler, like a, it is a walk-in walk cooler that is mm -hmm. a traditional cooler, um, but we took the compressor out of it because the compressor is really expensive yeah. um, and they tend to break down a lot. And so I decided we take the compressor out instead of paying the extra money for a compressor and fixing it. And we put a cool bot in instead, which is an air conditioning unit that comes, you buy a little black box that hooks up to the air conditioning unit. And that, um, what just tricks, I guess, tricks the AC unit into right. going a lot cooler. So I swear by a cool bot, I love cool bots. Yeah. Great. Me too. Yeah. All right. So number two um, the, of the common top five common farmer florist mistakes. Um, in the beginning of being a farmer florist is that you don't hire enough help. So again, it's really scary to hire help. It seems like a big investment. Um, any new business owner has a really hard time hiring help. Did you yeah. have a hard time? Oh my goodness. It's yeah. very frightening. It's so scary. You don't want to necessarily commit to somebody. You don't know how much it's going to cost, so on and so forth. Um, but if you really want to build a successful farmer florist operation, it's important to have a lot of hands to help with those critical timelines in wedding work because you 
can't have any excuses here for not showing up with the wedding flowers. It's not like if you get sick and you don't go to farmer's market, that really stinks and you'll lose money that way. Right. But nobody's going to threaten to sue you if you don't show up at the farmer's market. So it's good to have help um, and something that the sooner you can bring help on board, the better it'll be because you'll learn to let go of all the control um, and you'll learn how to delegate those tasks. Um, and you won't build a business that just leans on your own shoulders, which is what I did. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. it's really, really bad. Trust us, two very experienced yeah. business owners, two women who are exceedingly driven to do it all ourselves and have a real vision. Um, we yeah. both built businesses on our own shoulders and probably nearly crushed ourselves. Um, and I wish I had been smart enough to hire sooner. So. Well, and don't you think a lot of people could have been great businesses, but because mm -hmm. they don't hire, yeah. Yeah. they never... Yeah, they get that stuck. Next step. You get stuck, yeah, because yeah. you can't really yeah. grow anywhere from yeah. there if you continue to try to do everything yourself. And what I found is that I got into this um, exploded bloom of growth, so to speak, you know, as my business grew, it got so much bigger really rapidly that I was too stressed and too tired to actually hire good help. Right. Like I got too far beyond the, the ability to hire yeah. and then everything really fell apart for a little while. Um, but then as soon as I hired help, and learn to let go and learn to delegate. It was all yeah. up from there. Yeah, I yeah. mean, that's that's um, really, really key. So that's your second uh, top mistake that farmer florists make at the beginning. Okay, so number three, I'm reading my notes here, don't mind me looking down, but number three is focusing too much on the flowers in your field and not on foliage. So we all made this mistake at the mm. beginning. You get so excited and wrapped up in how pretty those flowers are and foliage is just this green stuff over here, and you assume that if you plant some Vipleurum and maybe some Dusty Miller, you'll be good to go. Um, That's not the case, and I hear this so many times from newer growers, um, but especially for farmer florists, you really, really need a, a, a stable full of really unique foliage, and you're gonna need a lot of it, because to make 20 or 30 identical centerpieces, you need to have that volume of foliage. And a lot of times new farmer florists really get sucked into just planting really sexy flowers um, and forget to dedicate a lot of space to foliage as well. So at my farm, I aim for 50-50. I've got 50% flowers and 50% wow. foliage because that's how much I love foliage. So plant more foliage if you're a new farmer florist and if you're just starting your very first crop plan for your farm, go back to the drawing board. If you don't have a lot of foliage in there already, clear a couple beds, get rid of some flowers, and put in some foliage. Yeah. It's really, it just makes designing so much easier. So mm. sure, you can make a beautiful floral arrangement with just flowers, but it's going to take up a lot more stem to fill that base. So if you yeah. have really good foliage and make it really interesting, then making a flower design from there is easy. So, all yeah. right. So all right. should we number, hit number four? Number four. Okay. So number four common mistake that new farmer florists make is not valuing their time. So it's easy for us as um, flower lovers to understand that there's value in the flowers um, and you might be tempted to charge for a bouquet based on the flowers that are in the bouquet. But if you're a wedding designer, an event designer, a farmer florist who's going to tackle larger scale events, mm -hmm. you really can't just price for the flowers. You need to price for your time as well. And a lot of time goes into making wedding flowers in particular. So if you don't value that time, then you're never going to really make a profit. So I find that right. a lot of new farmer florists are just pricing based on the flowers that they're using and they're forgetting to price based on their time and to value their time. Yeah. I mean, especially when you're not really comfortable in your yeah. job, like we are at this yeah. point, right. you feel like it's scary. Oh, it's scary. Exactly. <laughs> it's, scary. it's like, I've already got to tell them it's this much. What right. do you mean I have to add for my time? Right. And, yeah, um, exactly. And that's, to still be in the game three, yeah. four, and five years down the road, you, That's have, what you, have, to you have to charge right. for your time. Exactly. Yeah. And pricing is one of the things we talk about in the online course a lot. Yeah. And I try to bolster your spirits to <laughs> um, go out there and get them tired. So, um, so that is the fourth common mistake that I see is that you're not valuing your time if you're a new farmer florist. And then the number five mistake I often see and the one that I really made for myself is not trusting that my field could actually produce produce enough flowers yep. for a wedding. When I first started out, I was growing in a small community garden plot, and I actually just posted this to Facebook this morning, I think, a, a little yep. 
time capsule video that I completely forgotten about um, for the uh, original, not the original garden, it was the second garden I had ever started growing out of. So it was my second market garden. And that was a really small garden. Um, it was, I, oh gosh, I'm really bad at math off the top of my head, but it was like 40 feet by 120 feet or something like that. So whatever the math is for that in terms of square footage, but I think it was about an eighth of an acre. Um, and that really is where 11 Fresh Flowers was born and where I did wow. um, a lot of weddings out of that space. And it's really scary to think like, can <clears> I do this? But with proper planning, you really can. And I see a lot of new farmer florists that I coach and do consulting with, they tend to really doubt that they are able right. to grow enough flowers in their space, but you really, you really can. So, you know, <clears throat> excuse me. I know that even with me teaching flower farmers, mm -hmm. they do the same thing. Right. They really question their space. And then one of the things that I try to drive home to people is that, okay, if you only, if you have a small space mm -hmm. and you really want to do weddings, you have to really stick to what you're going yes, to grow for plan. wedding. You, have to you can't, you can't be growing. Mm -hmm. Oh, this is pretty, mm -hmm. or that's pretty, yeah. or whatever. Yeah, you, you, have, get to you have to be more focused, yeah, right? Don't more get focused by the seed catalog. Yeah, yeah. So, and you don't have to grow mm -hmm. everything yourself. That's the other thing. Start where right. you can. You don't have to just do a hundred percent of your own stuff, but you should try to grow as much of your own stuff as possible to be profitable. So right. That's another thing we talked about in the class. So the top five are prioritizing and getting a cooler. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Number two is not hiring help soon enough, which yeah. I mean, I can't That's across take the board. For that, that is across the board. <laughs> I can remember when I hired my first person, the relief mm. that it brought to me. Yeah, it's true. Um, you just yeah. never look back. Then. Right, right. Number three was focusing too much on the flowers yes. in the field yes. and not growing enough foliage. So yes. that would be number three is not growing mm -hmm. enough foliage. Yes. And number four is not valuing your time. Oh, and number five is not trusting your field. Yes, thinking yeah. that you need acres. Right, right. right. Uh, I, I think you can absolutely have a very viable farmer florist operation off of a half acre or a quarter acre. Yeah. A little less than, if it's your less than quarter acre, I don't know, you're really getting pretty tight there and it's it'll right. limit the number of large events that you can right. do, but you can still definitely have a farmer florist right. operation doing events off of a quarter acre. Right. So everybody that's on here got the email. That's how you got this link. So that means you got Jenny's PDF um, of your favorite yeah. containers, your favorite oh, yeah, container yeah. list. <laughs> um, so you already got those two pieces. And it also means that you're on um, our, we won't call it a preferred list, but it really is. It's people that are interested in what we're doing. We won't let you miss the registration opens. It's only open for five days. I know it's just oh, around the corner. Wow. It's right around the corner. Um, it's only open for five days. What that means is you can only register during those five days. Then the class starts. It runs for six weeks. Then. Yes. Yeah. And <clears throat> you'll have weekly Q and A's with Jenny. With um, me. With me. Yeah. You're going to talk to me. <laughs> and with, to answer any que the questions that you're going to be provoked to think mm -hmm. about after listening um, to her course. So we're really excited about it. So if you want to check out the course, go to the gardenersworkshop.com. Um, go to our online courses to the flower farming schools and you'll find um, some of the details there. We are really feel like we want to help other people yeah. get to where we are. Yeah. Y'all, the there's reason I'm doing this course. Yes, she had there, to convince me. I did. I had to convince <laughs> her to do it, but there's not enough of us. Um, you know, the market is saturated with imports mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. people using imports. Yeah. And we know that there are people that once they know about locally grown flowers, mm -hmm. they want their events, their weddings. And, um, and I really want to see more farmer florists doing sustainable wedding flowers yes. and doing it well and professionally and making a good business out of that, because that will ultimately help our industry grow and help us use things like regenerative agricultural practices to help heal the earth in the long run. So weddings are just a means to an end, so to speak, at least in my world and at my own farm. I'm using them as a way to make good profit so that then I can turn right. that profit into good works for um, building community and building right. this farm that's going to help heal the earth. So um, so that's why I'm motivated to do this course is because I want to help other people learn how to make enough money through weddings that their farm can do bigger and even better things um, in the big big picture kind of it's sensibility. True. So. 
because we know there's lots of people out there that want to do them. We read on the Facebook groups all the time, young growers, meaning young being new at growing, mm -hmm. that are committing to doing weddings in their first season or so. Mm -hmm. Very and scary. It is very scary. <laughs> scary for me to watch you guys yeah, do that. Yeah. So I want to help you do it. So you know, don't commit all the same yeah. mistakes I did, which I, I committed every one of those five mistakes I just gave you. I did those myself. Um, plus a lot more that I wanted to go over in the course. So I see we have a lot of questions. Let's so see let's what we have over there. here. Yep, oh, somebody's hi. getting, oh, Martha Mason's getting her cool oh, bot. Oh, Martha. Yeah, oh, there you yep, go. Yep, yep, yep exactly. Kate is asking, do you know what temperature range is best for refrigeration flowers? Oh, yeah, definitely. I noticed on Coolbot it has ranges in different size air conditioners based yep. on temps. Yep. So uh, the, the range of temperatures that you want to store your flowers at varies along the course of the season, at least for me. I've mm -hmm. always found the best. Yep. I don't know if you have, Lisa. Yep. So in the springtime, when flowers are used to cold weather outside, so we're talking about like ranunculus and tulips and all those things right. that are used to being cold anyway, they want to be as cold as possible in the cooler without freezing. So I aim to get my cooler as cold as possible, which usually is 34 degrees. Yeah. Um, usually a cool bot won't go any cooler than that. But then during the summer, when we get to the summer flowers like zinnias and even dahlias, and they are used to the heat outside, they don't want to get really super cold. So then we bump our um, cooler temperature to 40 degrees through the summertime, and then yeah. go back down again in the fall once the weather gets really cool again. So you, you're going to vary your temperature in your cooler, but um, you should definitely go with a cool bot recommendation to get it as cold as possible so you always have right. the flexibility to get as cold right. as possible yeah all right let's see here suggestions for foliage oh man i grow a hundred different varieties of foliage <laughs> there's a lot of them in the course i go over 10 of my favorite foliages for wedding floral design um, but i'll just throw a few quickies at you mountain mint is such mm. a wonderful staple yeah. no matter how you're selling flowers or what you're yeah. doing with them can't ever have enough never have enough of that um forsythia is a hidden gem that you may never consider <sighs> for foliage so forsythia is a is a um a secret weapon if you're doing installation work uh, as a farmer florist so so that's one you maybe never thought about and then you know the good old dusty miller that is never going out of style for wedding work is another one but i've got a very long list of foliages let's see i've been hit with the perception that commercial grown flowers are free of bugs and that farm grown flowers will be full of bugs how mm -hmm. do you handle that well go for that and i'm gonna look it's for kind of accurate <laughs> I'm not going to lie. Yeah. Uh, it, this is about customer education in my world. Um, we grow uh, completely 100% chemical free at Love and Fresh Flowers at my farm. And we are actually certified naturally grown at this point, which is the equivalent of being um, organically certified. And so uh, there are going to be bugs on my flowers. That's just part of the process. Yeah. And so I think it's important to educate your customers that that's a real possibility, that a ladybug is going to show up in their flowers occasionally, um, maybe an aphid. Frankly, nobody sees aphids anyway. But, but I like to say, I like to turn that story on its head, so to speak, instead of it being a bad thing that bugs right. are in the bouquets. The fact that there could be a bug in the bouquet means that it's actually a healthy, right. whole, like, that it's real, that, Chemical it's, that, it's, that it's been grown in a way that a bug could actually survive. So instead of being anxious about potentially having customers ask you about bugs in your flowers, I think you should really dive into that conversation and explain to them, well, the reason there aren't flowers on commercially or bugs on commercially grown flowers is because they've been sterilized with ridiculous chemicals that you don't want to even ever touch. Chemicals that could right. cause cancer, um, that have been um, studies have shown have caused blindness and all sorts of things. So instead, flip that script and, and use it as an opportunity to educate your clients on how you're using sustainable growing methods. So over here we have sorry, I'm squinting That's all right. That's comments. right. We're having to look. <laughs> So let's see, Sherry, do you just use chicken wire and floral frogs or do you use the plastic cages that are reusable? All right. I think you're talking about pillows um, <coughs> yeah. in terms of the plastic cages. 
in my floral designs in my uh, centerpieces, like those spilling over compost that I'm so well known for, that's chicken wire. Um, I don't generally use floral frogs. Um, it's not just my, it's just not natural to me. Like I learned on chicken wire, so I use chicken wire. Um, I find you're either a chicken wire fan or a flower frog fan. In terms of those plastic cages known as pillows, I have not actually worked with those at all. So I don't have any experience to talk about those in any way. So, sure. Yeah. So some, so Lily's asking what will the course entail include mm -hmm. just hit the six hit the six oh, session topics oh, oh, I remember them off no. the top of my so, head. <laughs> and what is your lead time in prepping for a wedding or event okay, I'm going to get, go the, get syllabus. the course syllabus okay um the lead time for prepping for a wedding or event <laughs> because I have a cooler. Remember, that was one of the top five mistakes that new farmer florists make. Because I have a cooler, I can start on a Monday designing for a wedding. So the very first steps I take in designing for a wedding happen on Monday. And then we just work at a slow, steady pace through the week and design um, little pieces of the puzzle all through the week. So this really reduces the stress that I have as a farmer florist is because I have that cooler to use so I can be designing well in advance. So we start on Monday for a Saturday wedding and just take a little bit of the time. Okay, so I'm just going to read you what the class titles are. A class is one week's so a lot of people, just like I didn't understand how classes work, the course is six weeks long. Each week you get a class, and a class is made up of many individual sessions. Sessions can be from 10 minutes, what's your longest? You got some long I've ones. I got some long ones, over an hour. Yeah, so I mean, yeah. each, so you get a, a, a group of a bunch of different videos. So um, class one, week one, is our weddings and events right for you and which one. She talks about every, I mean, oh, oh my goodness. <laughs> week two, which is class two, growing and sourcing flowers for weddings and events. So there's a little bit of growing information, but I want to be really clear here that this is not a growing course. Right. You should take probably Dave's class, actually, right. at yep. the Gardener's Workshop. His yep. is probably the one that you really should take if yes. you want to do weddings. Um, and then class three is finding clients. And this is where my sister lost her mind <laughs> because she talks about Instagram, Pinterest, Facebook, Google, and blogging, whether you should pay money to be on the wedding wire and the not. I mean, she, this is, I mean, this is an amazing course. Um, in itself, it's just a class special list. cocktail of my marketing yes. um, know-how online. So. And then class four is commuting, communicating with clients, handling those brides, right? Setting boundaries with clients. Really and then wonderful. week five, class five, is crafting a complete proposal package that was taking up all the pieces. Yeah. You know exactly what you should be giving that client if you haven't been doing weddings before. Class six, week six, is pricing for profitable wedding work. Yeah. Holy cow. And then lots of handouts. And then she has <laughs> a lot of handouts. And then, of course, like, so her course is going to come out, Early seems March. to me, on Wednesday mornings. <clears throat> and then you have a whole week to watch it. And then she'll do the Q&A the following Tuesday night. We've kind of set it up a little different than mine and Dave's class to give people more time to watch the sessions. Mm -hmm. And you do know that once you buy the course, it's yours forever. It's unlimited access. You can watch it as many times, as often as you want um, to go back and review things. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's a Q&A each week, and then there's a wrap-up the week after it ends to just kind of cover any questions that you may have come up. So someone's asking about the minimum size cooler you recommend. Right. The bigger, the better. Yeah. Um, but if you really do want to do fairly substantial sized weddings and events with your flowers, the way that I do at Love and Fresh Flowers, uh, you have to consider that you're going to have some fairly tall arrangements from time to time or on a regular basis in my case. So you'll do like large scale urns and stuff like that. So you really should ideally have a tall uh, cooler in some capacity. So the cooler right. that I have is um, 10 feet tall. Currently I'm building new coolers this coming spring. They're going to be 12 feet tall. Wow. Um, and then that way I can put lots of stuff in them and lots of shelving and so forth. So one of the things I will say is you should not, as a farmer florist at least, just try to get one of those um, 
like uh, display coolers, you know, the things that just have right. like the, the door you slide back and there's just yeah, like a few shelves. Yeah, you can shelves. find them pretty cheap around. You can find like, them cheap, but don't but fall that, for that. Yeah. Invest your money in an actual walk-in cooler yeah. because you need the space of the farmer floors for yeah. a lot of designs. And I think yeah. Dave even talks about in his class about building the room. Oh, and yeah. We're building the room. That's yeah, you build a room that's well yeah. insulated and yeah. anyway, I think Coolbot has some tips the, on that. The Coolbot too. website is phenomenal. They have all that information over on there. And I just wanted to, when Lisa was talking about my course, I just want to re-emphasize that every week, if you take the course, you get to talk to me personally yeah. in a live Q&A. This is really important to me. I really prefer to teach one-on-one, -on -one, and honestly, because I really believe in having a personal con connection with the people that I'm helping mentor, and I wanted to be able to answer specific custom questions for yeah. everybody. So that's why I'm doing the live Q&A and I plan on spending a good amount of time over there. Um, so I hope that you will, you'll just invest in the course so I can help you with that. Like yeah. I want to, I want to answer individual questions yeah. and not just kind of gloss over yeah. in big details. Awesome. So. I'm just really pleased and we're very excited about this course. Yeah, it's going to so. be a good one. And All right. Steve, wait, Robin asked real quick if the course will be offered next year. And I, I think so, right? Yes. If yeah. So it. it'll be offered once a year. The reason that we do this, you have to sign up during this small period of time and then we do the course that allows us to shepherd people like Jenny was just so talking about. So I can about. actually do a live Q and A session. Right. So I don't want to drag that out for right. every week for the next Right, so we want everybody to be on the same page and to be on the same courses. So yeah, you, you should be able to count on to that. And we're just really thrilled. And we thank you guys, everybody saying thank you. So we appreciate okay. it. So yeah. hey y'all, ciao till we meet yeah. again. All right. Bye, Bye guys. Hey friends, I just wanted to take a moment to share with you what some of the students are saying about Jenny Love's course, Farmer Florist School, The Wedding Process. Jenny of East View Gardens says, I'm a flower farmer expanding into wedding work with confidence and Jenny's course did not disappoint. She is knowledgeable, down to earth, approachable, and is willing to share all the details for success. I am beyond grateful to have the info in this course to come, keep coming back to as I figure out my own path. Thank you. Christine says, Jenny so generously shares her vast knowledge of flower farming and how to run a successful farmer florist operation. In this course, she shares everything from contracts to what specific flowers you should grow for weddings. Her knowledge and expertise has contributed greatly to the success and growth of our little flower farm. If you're a flower farmer thinking about dipping your toe in the event world or even a seasoned farmer florist looking to up your game, this is the course for you. It is filled to the max with helpful information and we constantly find ourselves revisiting the content over and over again. Friends, if you want to learn more about Jenny Love's course, head on over to thegardenersworkshop.com, go to the online course page, check it out, read other student reviews, sign up for the wait list, and don't miss this opportunity to start or expand your cut flower operation. Okay, welcome back. So I've included a link in the show notes to the PDF that they mentioned here, which outlines Jenny's favorite wholesale resources for vases and other floral design hard goods. I've also included a link to Jenny's on-demand workshop and her online school called Farmer Florist School Online, The Wedding Process, and that enrolls annually in October. I hope you consider taking Jenny's workshop and course they're both jam-packed full of information that's very useful for both beginner and more advanced farmer florists. You won't regret it. So that's all for today. If you like what you're hearing here on the Field and Garden Podcast, we'd love it if you'd tell a friend about us and leave a review for us wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you so much for joining me. I'm Jessie from The Gardener's Workshop, and I hope you have a great day. Mm -hmm.